Fans of the Jeffersons might remember actor Paul Benedict as Harry Bentley. Although he wasn't exactly a member of the Jefferson family, he's particularly hard to forget about given his distinct physical attributes. He certainly was their most unforgettable neighbor. Sure, he had his own signature aesthetic going on, but something was wrong. Both Benedict and his doctors were completely unaware he was actually suffering from a debilitating physical ailment, and if left untreated, Benedict could have faced an untimely death. If it weren't for an eagle-eyed fan in the audience at one of his stage performances and their helpful suggestions, he might not have learned about this rare glandular disease until much later. Today, we're going to share with you Paul Benedict's astounding story. And make sure you keep watching to find out where the rest of the Jefferson's cast ended up after the series came to an end. Paul Benedict's role as Harry Bentley wasn't exactly a creative choice. Sometimes, unique physical attributes help a character stand out from the rest of the crowd. Identifying traits can help differentiate one character from another, while other times, those idiosyncrasies morph into being an extension of their personality. For Paul Benedict, it was the latter. His character, Harry Bentley, was known for his very pronounced nose, jaw, hands, and feet. Benedict's body started growing that way while he was still in high school. It wasn't just the fact that he was tall. It seemed as if his extremities were all growing at an alarming rate. In addition to his abnormal growth patterns, Benedict also started experiencing agonizing headaches that made it very difficult for him to focus. Both his headaches and the unusual bodily growth plagued him for years. Doctors were unfortunately unable to determine what was causing his headaches until much later in his life. It wasn't until he was in his 30s that a specialist showed up in his life out of the blue and helped him figure out what was going on with his hormones. Narrowing down the cause Like most other TV actors, Benedict spent a lot of time acting on stage, before and after finding success on TV. In 1964, Benedict landed a co-starring role with the Theater Company of Boston. While performing one evening, an audience member penned a short note and gave it to one of the ushers in hopes that it would find its way to Benedict. The note arranged for the actor and the audience member to meet up after the performance. Benedict met with the attendee in the lobby of the theater after curtain call. The guest revealed he was a radiologist. He also inquired whether Benedict had ever met with an endocrinologist because he believed he might be suffering from acromegaly. Acromegaly is defined as a hormonal disorder that causes its sufferer's pituitary glands to produce excessive levels of growth hormones during adulthood. That would account for Benedict's towering stature and exaggerated features. The face, feet, and hands of an individual afflicted with acromegaly typically undergo intense changes, producing numerous other symptoms including splitting and chronic headaches. After suffering from this condition for over two decades, Benedict finally was able to meet with a specialist who was able to stop the progression of the disorder with a brief 20-minute procedure. If only he had discovered the solution 20 years sooner. Paul Benedict's Death and Legacy Benedict was found dead of natural causes on December 1, 2008, in his home in Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. He was 70 years old. As an actor, Benedict used his unique features to his advantage. He often played batty characters in films like The Goodbye Girl in 1977 and The Man with Two Brains in 1983. You can't bring up his name without being reminded of his role as the bad-tempered judge in 1991's The Addams Family. He was also good friends with filmmaker Christopher Guest and starred in a number of his films, including This is Spinal Tap, Waiting for Guffman, and A Mighty Wind. On the iconic children's program Sesame Street, Benedict had a recurring role as the Mad Painter, a character who maniacally painted numbers everywhere. Pay no attention to that English accent. Don't let his accent confuse you. Benedict wasn't close to being British. He grew up in Silver City, New Mexico. He was the youngest of six children, and his father was a doctor and his mother was a journalist. Benedict knew from an early age what he wanted to do with his life. When he was just five, he went to the movies for the first time. From that moment on, he was convinced he wanted to be an actor. He attended Suffolk University in Boston and studied theater. 
He started acting when he joined the Theater Company of Boston, a production company that boasts names like Robert De Niro, Dustin Hoffman, and Al Pacino as three of its prestigious alums. On Broadway, Benedict got the chance to work alongside Al Pacino in Eugene O'Neill's two-man play Huey in 1996. In 2000, he played the mayor in the revival of The Music Man. Benedict was also a successful stage director. He could take a newly developed play or a work in progress and infuse it with warmth, sympathy, intelligence, and humor. His first big break as a director was in 1987 with Frankie and Johnny in The Claire de Lune. He followed that production up with The Kathy and Mo Show, Parallel Lives, in 1989. Both plays garnered Benedict a lot of good press and became off-Broadway hits. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. And keep watching, we're about to reveal what the rest of the Jeffersons cast ended up doing after the show finished. What happened to the rest of the Jeffersons cast? Franklin Cover played Tom Willis. Cover was a mainstay on the show and was always the perfect comedic foil to George. After the series wrapped, Cover went on to guest star on a number of TV shows. He was also handed a supporting role in 1987's Wall Street. Some of his other film credits include roles in The Stepford Wives, Brain Donors, and Almost Heroes. After a brief battle with pneumonia, Cover passed away in 2006 at 77. Roxy Roker, Helen Willis Roker had a pretty long and successful career, but one of her biggest accomplishments was bringing Lenny Kravitz into the world. Not many people can say they've had the chance to raise such a talented person. Unfortunately, Roxy passed away in 1995 after battling breast cancer. Marla Gibbs, Florence Johnston Gibbs is still alive and kicking. She might be 89, but she hasn't come close to retiring. She still regularly stars in films and TV shows. Some of her most recent credits include Medea's Witness Protection in 2012, Grantham and Rose in 2015, and Station 19 in 2018. In addition to being an accomplished actress, Gibbs is also a distinguished singer. She's released a number of albums over the years. Sherman Hemsley, George Jefferson Obviously, George Jefferson is clearly Hemsley's best-known role, and the one that ended up defining his career. But he went on to guest star in numerous movies and TV shows as well. It was rare to hear anything about his personal life, which he preferred to keep private. But we do know he never married or had children. Hemsley dropped out of high school to join the Air Force. After that, he worked as a mailman for a number of years before he got his big break. Hemsley undoubtedly provided the comedic backbone to the Jeffersons. Sadly, he passed away in 2012, shortly after being diagnosed with lung cancer. Isabel Sanford, Louise Jefferson She was affectionately nicknamed Wheezy while on the Jeffersons, and arguably she was one of the best parts of the show. Not only did she constantly keep George in check, but she was entertaining to watch on her own. Isabel's career wasn't confined to just one show. She started acting in the late 60s and continued as an actress until her passing in 2004. She guest starred on dozens of shows and a decent variety of movies as well. In 1981, she became the second black actress to win a Primetime Emmy Award, and she's the only black actress to ever win for Outstanding Lead Actress in a Comedy Series. For her contribution to the world of TV, Sanford received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Reruns of The Jeffersons can still be watched in syndication. It's that type of show that offers the viewer a nostalgic look back in time while offering endless laughs that are timeless. It wasn't the perfect sitcom, but it provided a great deal of entertainment and dealt with timely issues that were especially poignant for its era. But more than just being endowed with a great script and experienced production team, The Jeffersons was lucky enough to have an all-star cast. It wouldn't have been the same series if any of the credits were filled by any other actor or actress. We'd love to hear from you. Which Norman Lear sitcom do you like the most, The Jeffersons or All in the Family? Let us know what you think in the comments section. And be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to Facts First if you haven't already. Click the bell icon to turn on notifications to stay updated on all our latest content.